Howdy guys, Cole here with woodkeys.click. Um, go ahead and get started. We are building a custom keyboard in five weeks, every Monday in April. So we're going to get started here with the uh, keyboard layout editor. Um, I've got I put out I put out the request to see who what uh, different layouts people would be interested in, and came up with a few designs. There there weren't a whole lot of submissions, but I got a few, and the best voted of those was the 60% HHKB style with arrows. So that's what we're gonna try to build here today. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up that image. So I didn't actually have that in in KLE. I found that image on the online. So we're gonna go through that whole process. Just bear with me for one minute. I'll find this image. Okay, so we're going to come up here to uh, Keyboard Layout Editor. If you're not familiar with this, you should be. It's the simplest way to make layouts. And they have a number of different presets. Uh, you know, everything from starting completely from scratch. Typical 104 key. If you could scroll over there, you'd see the rest of it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a 60% layout and then we're just going to make some tweaks to give it the design we want. So, first thing, 60% layout is going to have a split backspace. Right? We're going to take this key. Um, I'm going to use some shortcuts here keyboard shortcuts, but I'll show you how to do it uh, down here in the, in the properties editor first. Uh, so click on the key you want to change. You change the width down here. So we're going to change this to a 1U key. Um, you can also do that via the, short, via the keyboard editor just by holding down shift and left or right. Oops, up and down obviously makes it taller. Uh, shift, left or right. And then um, without shift, up and down left and right, move it around. So that's what we did. Add that back there. Backspace is going to come down here. We're going to make it smaller. Uh, and you can see down here, that's going to be a one and a half U backspace, which you'll have to find in your HHKB compatibility kit. So that's one of the things I wanted to consider when we were building this set, was what is the is, is compatibility with various key sets that are out there? So that's something and we probably want to we probably want to look at because you don't want to build something that you're not going to have keycaps for. So we could we could make a you know 1.25u backspace, but nobody has a 1.25u backspace in their kit. So that's not a very good idea to uh, go ahead and try to build that. So we'll we'll keep our backspace standard uh, HHKB size, which is not in every kit but it should be in a fair number of them. Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to shrink this a lot. I moved the, I moved the tilde over here. I could have changed the, le the legend, but I just, it's easier just to move it. I'm going to go ahead and add the new key and uh, make this an escape. You can, uh, if you're building like a key set from this, you may, you may want to spend some time looking at where the legends are and all that sort of stuff, but for our purposes, uh, we're not really concerned about that. It's just a matter of keeping stuff where we want to see it. So uh, we're going to shrink this shift down. It should be, I believe, a 1.75 shift. 
which again is something that's fairly common among most uh, key sets that are coming out right now. So you shouldn't have too difficult a time finding that. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether I'm sold on putting this arrow key to the left of shift. I think if I were going to use that right shift key, I would end up hitting that arrow key more often than not. But one thing we can do, which we'll probably end up doing when we get to the programming side of it, is instead of making this a shift key, let's make it a function key. And then we can make this a shift key when you hold it down or an arrow when you press it. May or may not work right for uh, you know any games you want to play where you might need to hold the arrow key down, but for the most part it should probably I work pretty well. So that's something you can do with a programmable keyboard, obviously, that, that might be useful. Uh, so we're going to shrink these three keys down to make our uh, arrow cluster. Change the legends. Uh, so in here, if you go to the character picker, you can find some uh, different icons. Uh, there's some good arrows in this uh, default set from uh, Keyboard Layout Editor. So you just find the arrow that you want, which is going to be the left arrow, and just drag it over there on the back key. Kind of small, so we can change the, the legend to be bigger. Really do that. Again, I'm not going to be too concerned about what it looks like, because this is going to be just used for uh, you know, design. It's not used for actual production of the keycaps. Uh, and no, I wasn't consistent about which ones I put on the left and which ones I put in the middle. But I'm not even going to change that right now. Um, okay, so HHKB layout also typically has a 7U space bar versus the 6.25 of the typical layout. So we're going to go ahead and uh, change that to not 6, 7. Obviously we need to move that so it's not overlapping that key, which is what causes these keys over here to change. So uh, HHKB layout says that you should put the control key where caps lock is caps like is normal so we don't need a control key down here so we're going to remove that shift the wind down to one U, and that's kind of the that's kind of the layout um, again I'm not I'm not real sold on the way these arrow keys are over here or the fact that controls up there I'm not a big HHKB user but I do want to build a layout with blockers because I think that'll be kind of interesting. Um, so we're going to go with this one. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy, enjoy this layout. And yes, I probably did copy this layout from, from some existing keyboard. Um, if that's the case, then I apologize to the maker of that keyboard. Uh, but I don't have one, and I don't know where to find one, so I'm going to make one. Okay, so um, you can do a lot of things in here. Um, I like to make sure everything I have gets saved, so I log into um, my uh, GitHub account, give it a name. This is going to be HHKB Arrows. Any good program ought to support a slash in the name, so I'm not worried about that. Hit save. And then you get. Uh, a link that looks like this versus uh, occasionally you see people that want that share via the other link that's a permalink button up here which gives you a long ridiculous uh, bit of text that looks good, that puts the entire layout in the URL which does not copy and paste well. This gets saved as a gist on GitHub so it works really well. Um, the next thing we want to do is yeah, it's like a it's like a YAS62. I've I've heard that. I, I could I could look up that layout, but 
Let's see, let's see if we can find a YS62. Let's see, can you actually see this? Uh, it's a saxophone. Uh, maybe we should put keyboard. Ah, there we go. KVD fans. That would be kind of ironic, right? Playing the KVD fans. Oh, that looks like it gets. We should do tag group by. Um, just about a year ago. Looks like we started. Cool. There you go. So, losing group by about a year ago. Here's the layout. Okay, so here's here's something that's typically done on a lot of layouts that we didn't we didn't uh, touch on yet, which is multiple uh, key support. We can definitely do that. Um, that is something that, that can be added in the PCB. Um, we can add that in KLE if we want to figure all that out. But oh, this one's interesting. Anyway. Um, uh, it's interesting because there's no like, full size space bar in any of these pictures. It's only only the uh, well, it's small space bar options. I assume the big space bar is supported as well. Okay, so back over here. We got. the layout done. So the next thing we want to do is we want to make a PCB. And there are a few ways to do that. Um, several programs, of course, that you can use. There's a KiCad or KiCad, as some people call it. I'm going to call it KiCad because that's what I call it. And there's Eagle, which was recently bought by Autodesk, which apparently has really great integration with Fusion 360, which I'll be using to design the case. So that, that's actually an interesting uh, idea to me to, to try to use that with the really tight integration between the two. But I haven't learned it. I've learned, learned KiCad because it's free, open source. So that's what I, I typically use. Uh, Altium is another one, and there's a few other packages out there. There's a Easy ADA, Easy ADA has one on their website that you can use uh, online. I think uh, Onshape has a there's a there's a browser-based CAD program. I think they have a PCB program that they're at least affiliated with as well. So, how do we take this layout and put it into KiCad and build a PCB? Well, there's a few ways to do that. The hard way, of course, is to just go and start plopping these things in manually. The easy way, which I prefer, is to use a script that uh, was written by Spindle, user Spindle, that has started the new uh, firmware project called T Plus, and he, he's also built a uh, tool that will auto-generate these uh, PCBs given a KLE layout file. So it doesn't completely auto-generate the PCB. You still have to do a significant amount of work, but it takes away the layout and making sure every key is in the right position. So a couple a couple of things we do here is um, it doesn't seem to like if we have a name for our keyboard or we have any legends on any of the keys. So a simple thing to do is just go through here and take those out. Let's see. Oh, it's 
left. So just going through here, deleting each of the, the areas where there's going to be a custom key. And then I'm going to download this layout. Um, and you remember I saved this earlier, so I want to make sure I don't save it now so it doesn't overwrite what I, what I just saved. So, although we could go back in and just history and see that. Okay, so we have a, a JSON file that I downloaded to my desktop. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to a. Um, see if I can get y'all to switch with me here. We're going to switch over to my terminal. All right, got to make me a new uh, screen here. There we go. And you can see my terminal. There we go. So this is in where I've checked this out from Git, and uh, if I do uh, Git info get status, um, no, Let's see. Git remotes. Sorry. Oh. I could show you what the URL is if I could remember the Git commands, but I can't. Get it, so somebody wants to show me the Git command to. Display URL. Uh, yes, Fox Dude, these videos will be available on both Twitch, VOD, and YouTube. Um, by the way, it is live streaming in simulcast to YouTube, apparently. So if you go search for my Woodcues channel on YouTube, uh, it should be over there. If you, anybody cares. Okay, so I'm going to copy. The file that I just downloaded from my downloads directory, keyboard, downloads. Keyboard, let me have that. Oh, I'm just about to type. So I need to make a directory, so no. No, no, no. Sorry. Trying to remember. Trying to remember how to do this. It's been a little while since I've been through this exact process, so uh, I'm going to copy this into my layouts directory. And I'm going to call it uh, HHKB arrow structures. Okay. Now I need to uh, use my handy dandy little uh, bash search feature here and find uh, this command. So, just to show you a couple of the options that I'm doing right here. So the first option is, uh, this is just running, I had to put Python 3 instead of dot slash py play dot dy because uh, apparently my system doesn't like to run Python 3 by default. And the we're given it the, the name of the layout and then the only option I'm specifying is the spacing of the switches. Um, common spacing is 19.05 millimeters or exactly three quarters of an inch. Um, I find that when I'm working in KiCad and when I'm working in Fusion, that makes all the math really hard. <laughs> and so uh, I, I prefer to go with what uh, Jack from OLKB has done and use 19 millimeters instead as my spacing. Um, so yeah, we're just going metric here versus uh, imperial units and, and rounding to the metric. So gives us nice, nice even numbers, so as I'll show you in a minute when we get into that. Okay, so if I look in the build directory, there should be an HHDB arrow folder. Why I drop the S. 
you'll see it actually generated a uh, some parts in SCAD, Open SCAD. Um, I haven't played around too much with those, but uh, supposedly you can go straight to a 3D printer um, from those files. What I'm interested in here is the one that's the CACAD PCB file. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make me a directory in my favorite place to create. And of course, you don't have to do this from the command line. It's just uh, it's just easier for me. So I like to put these in my this folder. I'm going to make a directory called HHKP. Dash arrows. I should give it a name, but I won't. And then I'm going to copy this build HHKP arrow folder or file. File. Okay, so now I'm going to fire up KiCad. If you call it KiCad, I'm sorry. You're gonna you're gonna think I sound funny every time I say it, but I think you sound funny. Uh, I'll, I'll get KiCad back on the screen here in just a second. It'll look something like this, which is not going to fit on your screen. But... I'm not sure if it does fit. Apologize for not getting all this set up beforehand. Would have made this go a little more smoothly, but you get to watch me do it in live live action right here. Apologize for that. I muted it. Um, there's some noise in the background. Okay. So all I was saying is that KiCad has uh, two different windows. Actually, every every little piece of KiCad is a different window. So the PCB editor is one window, and the Schematic editor is another one, so I'm I'm just setting each of these up right now to be able to stream. So bear with me one second.
so you have the uh, schema editor, the main window here, and then you have the PCB layout editor. So, what I believe happened is that when I created a new project, it gave me an empty, empty slate here, which is not exactly what we wanted. So, uh, I can fix that easily just by copying that file back over. I have to close it. Okay, good enough. This one may work really, really well. Um, I got a friend of mine joining me. He was he was going to be here a little earlier, but he's kind of running behind. But he was going to help out with the uh, helping helping monitor the chat and uh, questions and all that from the from the audience here. So let me uh, let me see real quick what's going on with the. Let's make sure that, let's see, I'm going to flip you back to this terminal that I'm looking at. So the interesting thing about uh, KiCad files is they're all text, text format. So if I want to see if this thing indeed got a, uh, get a, uh, a layout in it, then, okay. So yeah, it definitely does look like it has everything that it should, so that's no problem. So the question now is, uh -huh. oh, see, this is the problem. Um, I get an extra directory in my path, so. You can see that up there at the top. Turn the turn back up. There at the very top of the screen in the toolbar, you see the path, and it has an extra arrow, I mean, an extra level on it. So we don't want that. So we're going to instead up a level. There's no project there. So we're going to make a new project in not this directory, but that one. Now then, no, it still didn't like it. Okay. Stand by. Uh, I will fix this just by uh, moving the files. Easy enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this project so you're probably gonna see almost nothing at the moment. And I'm gonna copy. Directory, so now we just have the project in the back of this. Let's see if I can get that back up. See, this is this is the stuff that takes forever. It's not the actual development of it, it's the uh, it's the back and forth of the software. Let's see in the right.
Okay, so I just launched it. I got an empty and some open project. And there it is. See, what I should have done is made the project first before I created this. But uh, see, okay. It does this weird thing where it, it doesn't like to open a file with a different name. Pardon me. I'll clean this mess up again. Now, we want to rename this to match the name. Let's see, I'm not using the term. Rename this to match the name that my dad is expecting to see. Now, when we come over here, see it went ahead and refresh that and open it. Well, actually, open it. We have a populated PCB. Would you look at that? <laughs> I should mute my notifications. This is this is all this is all kind of learning as we go here. So oh see see this is should be sharing my entire screen, but doesn't seem to want to do that. So what you want to see is the PCD that we just opened. There it is. Now you see the magic. Okay. So you see it, it went in and it created the PCB with the kind of minimal footprint that it would need. Um, and yeah, we'll probably change that at some point. All I did is it laid out the switches it didn't lay out anything else uh, it didn't add anything to the schema which we'll see in a minute so it's not a complete solution but it does save a lot of work um, in terms of laying out the switches in the correct locations um, I'm gonna do one thing here hopefully and, yeah, And then just include the footprints, and I'm going to see if it'll let me. So what I'm trying to do is lock the footprints, but I guess it's not going to because I don't want to come in here and accidentally do that. And that one we could obviously notice, but if I accidentally do that, oh, I'm moving the label. If I accidentally do that, I might not notice that, and that would be really bad. And unfortunately, that did just happen to me on a recent PCB design. I didn't notice until I put it all together that I had to switch off by about an eighth of the unit, so. Um, that the, yeah, that was the uh, Scarlet, Scarlet Bandana. Bandana. If you haven't seen the Scarlet Bandana, go check it out on Reddit. Okay. So. This is, this is just a small portion of the actual design, but that is a lot of the manual effort in terms of laying that out that was taken care of for us. So the next thing we need to do is we need to launch a schema editor. And it wants to create us one. And of course you're not going to see this until I come over here and I'll reconfigure this to show the correct. 
So we have a blank schema in front of us. So we do have to bring in the entire PCB design from scratch, unless we happen to uh, bring in one from another project. And I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna do that. Mentioned Scarlet Bandana. Um, so I brought in the entire uh, schematic. And the matrix. This matrix is obviously not the same as the matrix that I have. The columns are not the same. Uh, but it will be. Uh, a good starting point. I'm gonna mute off for just one second. Right. Okay, sorry, back. Just having a little, uh, little technical chat over here. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat, and Mike will uh, read those out to me, so I don't have to monitor the chat on a full-time basis. Okay, so we're going to go to the matrix first and get uh, get this how we want it. Um, so what you see here is a typical switch matrix. This is the column to row layout. So we have uh, all the columns across the top. And these are global <laughs> labels, which means that they work across the different schematic sheets. You'll see me going into and out of this schematic sheet. So there's one at the top here, uh, buttons at the top that let you leave. And then you can look at the entire, let's see if you are able to see this. No. Okay. Well, it popped up a little window that has the different uh, levels in this in this schematic. But I only have two. Well, I do have I have a total of three sheets. So I have a sheet with the matrix and a sheet with the uh, RGB under the load. So this is just a simple. We'll go through this first because it's real simple. Um, these are WS2812B LEDs that are going to be placed on the bottom of the PCB. Each one has a 0.1 microfarad capacitor next to it, uh, connected between DCC and ground. That, that gives it kind of uh, inverse current. So when the LED turns on, it can draw from that capacitor and not have to draw from the main bus lines. And then it's 
pretty much it. They're wired in a series and they make up uh, what amounts to a shift register. So I did something a little bit different with the labels here, which is I put this one that you see that's kind of yellow. And if you look over here on the right, uh, you can add these. These are hierarchical labels. So this has a DN label and that ties to the DN on the first LED. And then I used a local label here um, where you could uh, map this label to that label and the, oh, sorry, the zoom on, on here is uh, kind of obnoxious sometimes. Um, but it maps this to there, so I didn't have to draw a wire across. So it's the same same thing. I just naming that naming that line instead of instead of running a wire through. And then the last one in the series, it is not connected, has a no connect symbol, um, which means you don't want it to be connected. You always want to make sure everything is either connected to something or has a no connect symbol on it. Otherwise, the design rule check will complain when you run it. So. The back to the matrix. Or actually, I'm going to pop back at this real quick and, and go over what I just just said. So, this, if you use the hierarchical labels, this sheet actually becomes something like a component, and it it has its own uh, pins on it here, and then you wire those up into the rest of this this drawing. Uh, so you see here, I used a local label, which I then connected over here onto the schematic for the uh, AT Mega 32U4 controller. That's probably the, the right way to do it, obviously. Um, I didn't do that on the matrix because I already had that matrix defined from a different project with the global labels, and so I just, I just used that. So the global labels, then you don't have to wire them again into your into your matrix, uh, into your project on the other sheet. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through, um, I've gone in and, and actually put the names of each of these, each of these uh, switches, you know, what their, what their function is, and those will show up as labels on the PCB, which you'll see in a minute. Um, so we're going to take off this left-hand column these left hand two columns because those are not part of this layout. So I'm just going to select them and then delete that block. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and drag this over here. And we will. Then wire these up so the so we're gonna we're gonna hook these back up where they're where they're supposed to go. So the way to do that is to use a, a wire over here, place wire. Um, there's also the shortcut W for wire. Um, one of the new features in the latest versions of KiCad, so that I don't have normally what you would have to do if you had this row, if say I had gone in here and deleted. And I had when I was doing this from scratch, I had all these wires across here. What you would have to do in the old version is you'd have to click here. Oops, what did I do? Uh, you have to click here. Sorry, I got my hand on the wrong key. Wire. Click. 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 All right, it should take forever. Um, the new version lets you do this. Click here, run it across all those, and it automatically places those junctions, which is really kind of handy. Uh, make this easier. I don't need those because I'm just doing this by hand here. So, okay. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. That is one of the one of the big frustrations uh, with using KiCad is the zooming system because it lets you, uh, it at least on the Mac, it zooms all over the place. 
it zooms probably more than you expect. And depending on what mouse you have, it can be really, really obnoxious. It does it on Linux too. It does it on Linux too? Okay, yeah. Uh, that, I, I think what they need to do, you know, most of the time you can set your mouse to scroll one row at a time or three rows at a time or something. I think, I think what they're doing is they're looking at how many rows you told it, and that's how many zoom levels they're doing. So we need to make a setting for that somehow, I would think. Maybe we'll open an enhancement request at some point. And if I cared about trying to program in Python, I might actually go in and try to fix it. But <laughs> it's Python. Sorry if you like Python. OK. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to renumber these columns that I had adjusted in here since I took those out. I don't want to have those columns I can't count today. I like how my regular mic get not with you. Mike was supposed to be here to provide the color commentary, but I held up. It was running a little late, so we didn't have a chance to go through this beforehand, so we didn't have a, a real good game plan on how that was going to go. Otherwise, tune in next week when I'll be way funnier. I super promise. I don't know if you can hear him at all on the. You are very slender. Okay, go. <laughs> this one, this one. Yeah. Should I install Discord? Should install Discord. I think we want to install Discord. Okay, sorry. Got distracted. Let's go finish these off here. Should end up with 15 columns on a 60%, right? That seems like a good count to me. 14 and 15. 5 by 15, that's 60%. So now we're going to go through and we're going to make those same changes that we made to the. Actually, it says too many columns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Oh, maybe it's just what they're defined as. It's, this is a 65% layout that I was originally working from. And so it has an extra column on the right, and I'm trying to figure out where that extra column came from. Or where that extra column Went, should have had. I guess it's just the way it's wired in the matrix, so that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to change this uh, label for caps lock to control. And then we're going to delete the control key down here, which we deleted off of the KLE file. Delete the extra wires. And we still have a win and an alt. And I am going to go ahead and leave in the split space thing. We're probably going to add a split space option to this. I know that's not typical HHKB layout, but we're going to go ahead and add that in. Every keyboard has Yeah, every keyboard should have a split space, but I agree. At least an option for them. And then we've got space, and then we have a right alt, and then we're going to have some arrow keys instead of all this other stuff. So, Conveniently, we already have arrow keys to find over here, so if I just delete these extra delete. 
delete this extra, right shift, and then we're going to need to delete. Oh, look, it's, I'm going to go count how many columns there are in KLE because I'm not really sure how this is working. Or we'll just count how many columns there are in the PCP editor. Okay. Everybody count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 12, 13, 14, 15. Come on. That's what it's supposed to have. So why? I need a macro pad program to do these switches for me. Seeing switches. You could also just share your head screen. I don't, I, I didn't see that as an option. Probably could. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fourteen, fifteen. Okay. This is what happens when you take an existing file and you try to edit it. And you're left with this weird situation where some stuff does not feel like you think it should. Zero minus plus backspace. The backspace should oh it, yeah, we're gonna split backspace. That's right. Okay. Never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh so what we've got here, I just I'm just looking at the layout wrong. Apologize, it, it is all correct. What we have here is a option for us extra key. And the way this is defined is you have two keys stacked up on top of each other and then in the next column over you have the other key. Um, so here we have a either a 2U backspace or a 1U backspace. And what we'll do on the layout in the PCB editor is we'll, we'll move those to different physical positions. Um, so you can see I had an, another extra key down here in this layout. I'm going to take it out because we don't need it. We also don't have a page up or a page down. This is, this is like I said, 65% style where it has all this extra stuff on the end. I think we can actually get away with 14 columns in the matrix if we're creative on this on this layout. So we're going we're gonna to do that just for just for the fun of it, kind of the exercise of let's let's get away with as few columns as we can. And even though there are 15 physical columns, we have a lot of empty spots in the matrix because of wider keys. And we're going to take this delete. And we're going to move it down into a different position in the matrix. We're going to take these arrows and we're going to move them over. So we're going to. I'm going to take these arrows and just delete some of these wires, and I'll have to put them back later, but it's hard to move stuff around with wires attached to it. So I'm going to grab this block and just move it out of the way for a moment. Now I've got my arrow cluster, and I'm going to move all the way down here to line up with this column, and then we'll put this right shift back line up right there and then see we have a, this delete key which we can put anywhere we want into the any empty positions. We just put it down here next to the inner. It is it is best to go ahead and put that as close in the matrix to a physical key as it's going to be, otherwise your matrix is gonna your wiring on the PCB is going to get really weird because if I put this delete down here by the space bar now I have to have a physical wire connecting those two points in the matrix on the PCB and we don't want that. So. But we're gonna move that down here. Wire all this up. Like that. Showing off this new feature that I was talking about earlier. 
put all the junctions in automatically. And let's see if that needs to go to here. Okay, now everything should be nice and wired up. Now we only have 14 columns in our matrix, which means one less pin on the microcontroller, which we could maybe use for something else if we want to. Okay, I believe the matrix. Well, it's not quite good. We do have a couple of other things to do. This is, in fact, not a delete key, but it's rather a tilde. And the uh, this, by default, is not going to be the backslash. It's going to be the backspace. And then up here, like I said, we have the option for a 2U backspace or a split backspace with the tilde. If we do the split backspace, it's going to be a uh, backslash. I think that's the default version. You're going you're gonna to have a wood case for this, right? Yes, this is going to have a wood case. It's going to be a wood case HHKB. HHKB, nice. Yeah, HHKB, what's that part of it? I did. Sorry I was late. Sheesh. Okay, so we will have the option for 2U backspace and then there's this backslash tilde up there or backspace and then if you put the 2U backspace, obviously you put the normal backslash, it's normal location. And then instead of tilde over here, this should be escape and I already changed all these labels up, so we should be good to go. Pop back out of this and we'll finish. So if you get lost like this in CAD, you can see it's it's all the way down here in the corner. There's a fit button which will fit everything back to your window. You'll find that you use that quite regularly. We'll look at what else we have wired up in here. So we no longer have 17 columns, so I don't need columns 15, 16, 17. And like I said earlier, I want to make sure that I put a no connect on that. So this is the no connect. Put a no connect on each of these pins that I just removed. So you see that we have all the columns wired up, uh, wired up to the different pins. And I chose these locations based on the physical wiring for the previous board. So a lot of times what you'll do is as you're running the traces, you'll see that they don't necessarily match up to where you expect them to be when you're running the wires. So it might or might not, we might have to end up having to come in here and, and rearrange which columns are connected to where in order to minimize the number of traces that have to cross, uh, things like that. So we'll, we'll take a look at that if we need to. Um, it's also gonna kind of depend a little bit on where the controller is placed physically on the PCB, which in this case will most likely be uh, down by the enter key. I mean, down by the space bar. Although since we have the split space, that may not have enough uh, free space down there. We'll have to see. But that's where we're headed here in just a minute. Right now, we're gonna look at um, what else is in this in this diagram, just so you can see uh, what, what to expect. So I do have this wired for a mini USB uh, with just the four pins. I have done several with USB-C, might end up doing that on this one as well, probably would if it were a production PCB. Given that they're a little more difficult to hand solder, and I'm going to be hand soldering the prototypes for this, I'm going to go ahead and leave it as a mini USB. For mini USB, we want to have uh, 22 ohm resistors in series with the data pins, and those connect through. Uh, we're connecting VCC to the VBUS on the USB, VBUS on the 
controller and then all of the other VCC pins on the controller as well. Each of these VCC pins, you'll see when we get to the schematic, I mean, get to the circuit layout early, later, they're going to have a capacitor next to them. So that's what these are stacked up here for. There's a, in order to get, uh, in order to provide kind of a, a holding tank, if you will, for, for current that can be used on demand by the controller. You, you put those physically near each of those pairs of uh, power and ground pins, which there will be several connected around the, around the PCB. Uh, a couple of other interesting things to note. Um, I'm using a ceramic resonator instead of the crystal that a lot of people use. Uh, the crystal has four pins. It has to be oriented properly. It requires two external capacitors. The ceramic resonator has three pins. You can orient it either way, and the capacitors are built in. So it's not quite as accurate, but since we're not doing high-speed USB, this is a keyboard, we're doing low-speed USB, and uh, nothing is really time critical. I haven't had any issues with the one that I'm using. Uh, so I'm going to stick with that unless I have issues. A few, of the, a few of the pins that are wired up here with, with, with the names, um, you have the, these four pins with the names right here are for SPI or uh, insert in-system programming. So those map to a header that's going to be physically placed on the board that can, you can, if, if there's something wrong with the USB bootloader, you can't load it over USB, then you'll have the option to connect a physical cable to it and reprogram it externally. So I always like to map that out, um, even if it's just some, some pads that you could solder to, because it's a whole lot easier than trying to solder to the pins on the microcontroller if you end up needing to do something, especially if it's a prototype. But even in the production board, I like to have those accessible somehow. The Next thing here is the reset switch. It's going to be a 10 kilo ohm pull up to VCC so that it doesn't uh, float in an unknown state. You always want your uh, things like that to be in a known state. So it's got a warp resistor and then it's a high, a high value so that when you push in the button, you're not drawing a lot of current. Um, and then similarly on the HWB line, that is a an interesting quirk of the of the controller. When the chip is reset, it reads that line. Um, it can be used for general purpose I.O., but it's best just to tie that to, to ground with the resistor as well. Uh, this time it's ground instead of uh, being pulled up. So. And then I've got audio on uh, pin C6, just tied to a, to a speaker over there. And then, like I said, all the rest of it is just the columns that are connected up. Um, one more thing here, there's a, a UCAP line, which is the uh, capacitor for the, US, for the USB uh, driver on the the controller, so you just need this extra one capacitor to ground from that pin. That's pretty much all there is to the schematic. I do have some mounting holes over here. I like to tie my mounting holes to ground. Um, you know, there's different different schools of thought on that, but I like to I like to do that. Then your screws will mount. If you're mounting to a metal case, then your screws will tie that case to ground as well. I feel like it helps with. Uh, protect it from interference. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it for the schematic. We're going to take this schematic and we're going to turn it into the file that the PCB is expecting. So to do that, we're going to have a couple, well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a design rule check. Actually, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to annotate the schematic. So you notice that a lot of these had a question mark. 
uh, every component has a question mark next to the name. We want to number all of those switches, I mean all those components, and so that we can identify them. So we're going to do use the entire schematic. So this is kind of important because we want our, our switches to be numbered in a certain order. So we want them numbered across by rows. So I'm going to switch that and then that is all. Okay, so now you notice we get capacitors that now have numbers. If we go into the matrix, our switches are now numbered by row. So 1 through 14, 15, 16, 17, etc. So, next thing we're going to do is we're going to run this design rule check. And it didn't tell us anything, which is good. If, I, uh, for instance, I had deleted this link right here, and I run that again, it's going to tell me, hey, that is not connected. It's going to give me a mark right there. That lets me know that everything is connected where it's supposed to be. Because sometimes you might do something like this. And if you didn't look really closely at that, you might not realize that it was not connected. So the design rule check is always something you want to look at to make sure you have everything connected where it's supposed to be. And it'll go through some other things that it will warn you about as well. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, associate the components to footprints. Yeah. 14 columns or 15 columns? The, the keyboard is physically 15 columns wide. But I made the matrix 14 columns because with the with the modifiers, it, it's running. Sorry, just to explain why this is waiting right here. It's it's running through and loading all of the libraries. Is why it's taking forever. So let me let me pull this back up here in the. Um, do, do, do. I just I just wanted to make sure. No, you're fine. That you weren't missing. Um, Yeah, so what we, what we did is we took where each of these modifiers is, so the top row is all 1U keys, right? So there's 15 of them across, but then each of the other rows have keys that are wider than 1U. So there's, there's, only, there's only, for instance, 13 keys in the second row. Mm -hmm. So we took this key, and in the matrix, we moved it down to the next row. Actually, I think we moved it to the to the third row. Okay. Got a second. No worries. Okay. That's what I'm here for. So most of this stuff is already associated, and it's associated because I brought this in from the other project. Um, normally, you want to go through it, and you'll have to, to pick these things out. And I'll go through and show you what, what I did here. So I used the capacitors. I'm going to use service mount components for all of this. The capacitors, I made all of them 0603 capacitors because 0805 is really huge, and you know, at least when you're trying to lay stuff out on the board. And 0402 is absurdly small. Um, I have a picture somewhere of an 0402 sitting on the surface of a penny, and it's about the size of Abraham Lincoln's nose. <laughs> so not very big. Uh, diodes, I use the SOD123 package. There's a couple of other packages that you could use. Uh, there's some, some smaller ones that are 0805, the little uh, round red ones, the little glass Class ones. I, I've, I've worked with those. They're a little difficult to work with, finally. So I don't typically use them. Not as easy as the SOD 123. That's no. Yeah. SOD 123 are, are kind of obnoxious in their own right, but I've done enough of them. They're, they're fairly simple. Uh, and they're cheap. If you don't understand what footprints are and why, how, how wires are 
since you these things. That's a good point. If you don't understand what footprints are and why I'm associating these things, it will make more sense when we go to the, to look at the circuit board. But for instance, a capacitor on the schematic could be a through-hole capacitor, and it could be any number of these through-hole capacitors. Uh, I can show footprints later. This does not show footprints. Um, oh yeah, it does. You selected footprint. Hey, there it is. Okay, that's a footprint. You see, it's 42 millimeters by 23 millimeters. That's a really, really big capacitor. Um, what we're using instead is an 0603 surface mount capacitor, which, if I use selected footprint, oh, you know what? That's probably not showing up on the stream. <laughs> All right. I believe that we are now good to go. Okay, back in business. Where were we? We created the net list. I click the button on the net list. And I click generate. No, yeah, we already did that. So now we're going to bring that net list into here, into this uh, layout. So we click the corresponding netlist button, which looks just the same. And now it's going to tell us which uh, footprints to use here. We're going to I'm going to tell it by timestamp because these are probably not going to have the same references. Or no, I think they are actually. So I'm just going to leave that. And then actually. Let me just let it sit down. Okay, so these these did have numbers, so this is numbered switch 14, this is switch 15. And I think because of the way that they're laid out in the schema, it's gonna it's gonna have problems with that because of the way they're numbered over here. So I'm gonna change this. I just can change these manually and then when I remember these they should be correct. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to renumber these these manually. It's because I have this this one out of the normal matrix position. So I'm just gonna have to go each each of these one by one across. It's just this one. It's not too bad. This is supposed to be switch 16. And I'll be able to see this over here. Right, switch 16, the next row is supposed to start with switch 30. And it starts with 29. Why does it start with 29? Ah, see, this is what I'm talking about, the zoom. It's kind of Okay, so it did. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. I see. It's because I moved switch 15 down to the third row, not the second. So I've got to start all the way down here at what says switch 15 and then I'm going to have to uh, renumber these these backwards. So it's just a little bit of manual work here. So that's going to be, I'm adding one to each of these because I'm moving that other switch back up.
tapping that blank in case you're wondering. Again, this is this is something that you could probably get away with doing a little bit differently. If I had if I had thought about it, I could have manually numbered this switch 15, and then it would have skipped over that number or something that auto generated. It's late, but could you have could you have done that? Could you have manually numbered that switch and have re, redone the, the numbering? Uh, I couldn't have redone the numbering, but I I could have done it in the first place, I think. or I could have done it before I moved the switch down. Then I could have moved it and then it would have fixed it. Almost there. That's not good. That's not good. Sorry, change that number. Okay, so now they are numbered properly. So now we're going to re export the netlist and save it to the netlist file. And then over. Now when we read the netlist, we're going to do it by reference. We're going to I'm going to exchange the footprint. So the ones that came in with this are a different footprint than the ones that I mapped. So I'm going to change those out. Um, none of this stuff really applies because I haven't done anything. This is kind of if you're redoing stuff. Um, so I'm going to hit read current netlist. It's going to say done. Okay. So it came in with a whole bunch of extra components. We're going to put these all up here. And you see all of these wires that need to be connected. Um, we can make those go away by clicking this button over here, and that makes it easier to see what we're doing um, without having all those in the way. So each of these is a switch footprint. Um, what you're looking at here, you might think this is kind of weird. Why would I be seeing something that looks like that? That doesn't look like a switch footprint. Well, what that is, is that is a Kale MX socket. Um, if you're not familiar with those, you reach in that box right over there. There's a button up there. Um, so that is a I could probably blow up my camera big, let's see. Hey, look. This is a socket, sticks in right there, and I can, if I pull some keycaps off, make it easier to get to, I can take a switch puller, and I can reach in here, and I can grab the switch, and I can pull it right out. And then what you're left with is is a hole in there. So this takes away the need to be able to solder. You can just pop in the switches. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to build the PCB with these uh, in that sockets because I like them. Kind of makes kind of makes stuff more accessible for for those that don't know how to solder, and it, it's just a time saver for the rest of us. So. Also, it's really easy to try out uh, to do science. Yeah, so you can do lots of different switches really easily. You can put lots of different switches on the same board. You can change your switches based on how you feel that day, whatever. Um, they have a pretty high lifespan rating. So, one thing to note here is that what is the placement of 
the PCB, you'll see that there are essentially two sides to the PCB. Um, well, because we have a two-sided board. And they have colors up here. We have, uh, oh, sorry, let me flip back. Let me flip back. Okay, so there are two sides to the PCB, two copper layers, F for front, B for bottom. Uh, let me have that thumb pad back. Here's the PCB. We want to put the components that are going to be soldered surface mounted on the bottom. So normally you want your switches to be mounted to the top because they're going to be on the top. But because the switches are, because we're mounting this socket instead of an actual switch, we want to mount them on the bottom. So that means that the script that uh, Spindle had written by default puts these on the front, which is the red layer. And that's not where we want it to be. So we have to flip all these. So we right click and say flip, or you see here the shortcut is F. Then when we flip it, um, for whatever reason, they decided that when you flipped it, you wanted to flip it vertically around the Y axis instead of horizontally around the X axis. Uh, you know, maybe for some PCBs that makes a lot of sense. For our so that just means I need to then rotate everything. So I'm going to use R. I'm going to rotate everything twice to get an orientation I want with the LEDs at the bottom. Oh, accidentally hit flip again. Rotate, which is R. Now you'll see the uh, label that we gave it is going to be on the top, and the name of the switch is going to be on the bottom. And it has uh, LED. holes here which we didn't wire up um, so actually what I'm gonna do because this is not the footprint I want to use because I'm not gonna put LEDs on all of these for this particular board so I'm not even gonna include these holes in there so I'm gonna change the footprint so what I'll do is I'll uh, right click and say edit I don't see where it's at I'm gonna say E for edit <laughs> And I'm going to click Change Footprint. Now I have a footprint in my library. You can find this on my GitHub page. I'll link it at some point. Um, a lot of these are copied from, from other people's. But, um, so I have one that we're using right now, which has the LED holes. And we have another one, which does not have the LED holes. So we're going to use one without the LEDs. And just going to double click that to bring it in here. Now, I don't just want to change the footprint switch one, I want to change all of the ones that are using the, uh, the other footprint. So, I'm going to do that. It's going to change everything on the board. While we're waiting on that, I really hate to let slip so that everybody knows like, how casually you just popped the, like, this entire board off. <laughs> of all of these switches and you're just like look at this thing now I'm going to slide it right back on because yeah. of the sockets that's just so, that's the so you want to you want to see what what Mike's talking about when I wanted to show you the PCB off of this uh, numpad I just pulled it off because they're all held in here by these <laughs> sockets and then I just put it back on <laughs> and and you can do that <laughs> and that is one of the cool things about that and you that's one of the cool things about the uh, Navy box, which is they put their uh, least cool things about the box. <laughs> okay, so now I have to go through and rotate all of these. And unfortunately, if I uh, select a bunch of them and say flip, it, it moves them because it flips them all along whatever axis they decided to on their center axis. 
oops, it's set. Um, luckily, I should be able to undo that. And so I'm just going to use these keyboard shortcuts to go through flip, rotate, rotate. Flip, sorry, rotate. Flip, rotate, rotate. What I should probably do is modify the script to do this in the first place. And I will do that. Let's see. I rotated the wrong thing. So that's that's what can happen sometimes. If you, it's picking what's ever under your cursor, and it picked the uh, the label. I'm going to have to fix that. There we go. So if you hold down uh, the, well on Mac, if you hold down the super key, the command key, and scroll, it'll go sideways. And if you hold down the shift, and scroll a little bit up and down. So that's a handy way to navigate around. I thought for a second you were talking about in general, but you mean in Kai In Kai Kai, okay. yes, not, not in general. This is like, well, okay. I'm pretty sure they probably. Too many times. Nope. Oh, I rotated the see, I rotated the level. Okay, so I got all those. I have three extra switches up here, which did not come in because they were not part of the original layout um, that I did from KLE. So um, select that and hit move. This is the, the backspace, the extra backspace, if you want a 2U backspace. It's actually really hard to kind of fit in here. It won't fit like this um, because these are going to have actual sockets attached to them. We have to be careful about where we're going to put this. Luckily, I've done this before and I know where I can first thing I need to do is I need to set the user grid. You go to user defined grid up here and you specify a, a grid spacing. You want this to be the to be one eighth of your grid spacing. So in my case that's 19. Um, so 19 divided by 8 is 2.375. What that lets you do is it lets you move the switches with some precision without being able to move them anywhere and having to get them in exactly the right spot. So you see here what what would have happened if I would have used 19.05 is that would have been the fraction and that's really kind of obnoxious or if I was doing inches which I could do that's the fraction which has even more digits which is not something I want to deal with so I like 19 only need three digits of well, four digits of precision technically, three decimal places, and uh, that makes it a lot easier to work with. There's a bug in this version where it zooms off in the middle of nowhere. Really kind of obnoxious. But if you have something selected, it zooms to it. So if I rotate this, I have found that it will fit. I need to make sure I can line them up vertically. It will fit here. Um, there's some overlap, and it's going to cut off the corners of these pads just a little bit. But uh, I did find that it will work properly. I was able to solder on all of these sockets, and they work without having uh, any, any problems. So, uh, depending on what fab you use to make these, they 
they could possibly complain about these and the the design rule check that we're going to run later will definitely complain about you having these extra um, I mean these overlapping pads but that's just something you have to deal with if you want multiple uh, multiple layout support so you'll see here that this uh, this label has now gone off the edge of the board and so excuse me I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange some of these labels so that we kind of have less, less overlapping. Um, so I'm going to move these over there. Oh, I may want to do this one. I don't have the grid space. That's right. I'm going to move these down here. Um, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably end up coming back and, and adjusting these labels when... I don't have the grid spacing set. But, that'll work. Okay. That's good enough. Yeah, because I do want to get to uh, I do want to get to wiring this all up uh, before we end the stream. I may not. I most likely will not get it done before we end the stream, but I do want to. Let's do something. Um, okay, so this is interesting. Now I have down and right. Oh, I see what happened. Okay. Right now, what happened is because um, I specified left space and right space, mm -hmm. and I added those into the matrix, but I didn't add them into the KLE file, so they're not populated. So I actually don't know exactly where those switches are supposed to go. So we'll go through that exercise of, of locating where the switches should go. Here um, okay. So these switches are the two culprits. So there's a couple ways we could do this um, in order to fix this. I could move all the switches. That's probably the easiest way. Um, I just have to make sure that I move them to the correct location. So my right key is supposed to be there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move I'm gonna move all these down two clicks, and then you can see it. I don't know if you, you may not be able to tell, but it's snapping to the grid as I move them. So it's two two grid spaces down. So now this right hand key is gonna go here. Down key is going to go here. Left key is going to go here. Right else is going to go here. Now this one is the one that I don't know exactly. Oh, that's space. Space is going to go over here where this one is going to sit. Then, okay, so now I've got this, I just call it L space and, and R space just for simplicity. I don't have the exact position of where these are supposed to go. Um, so what we need to do is we need to determine what that's going to be. They're going to be somewhere in here, but let's flip back over to KLE and we will use that to determine where they're going to go. So, the I didn't even I didn't even draw them in here. But if I move this down and make room for some more keys here, we're gonna add three keys. We're gonna move them all up. So I need to figure out two things. I need to figure out where is the stem on a seven U space bar? Is it in the middle? We, we do some research on it. I'm gonna assume it's in the middle for right now. If anybody knows, feel free to chime in and chat if the seven U spacebar stem is in the middle or not. Because I would like for the middle switch to line up with the seven U spacebar switch, and so then I don't have to have an extra one. Um, and then I would like for these to be some kind of common key sizes. Uh, that you might see. So ideally this would be like a two 
It's right now it's a two and a half, so that would not be a very good switch size to use. So 275 is the right shift, which we're not using. We could put it right here. It would have right shift as the name on it, but you could get a set that wouldn't. Um, and then 225 is very common as well. And then two. So if, if we could do 225, 2, 275, that would be ideal. But I don't think these switches are going to line up. Because the center of the stem for a 2U switch is in the center, and a stem for the 7U switch is, is probably in the center. Right? One's in the center, and then you have two on the outside. For the steps. For the steps, yeah. Yeah, so this, this I don't think I have a 7 space spacebar. Do something. So what you're saying is that that middle, that middle space bar, yeah, is going to have to be, or you're going to have to figure. Out, you need two, two, two basically switches. One right there in the center for that seven, and the one in the middle of that middle split space. Yeah, so I would have to have a fourth switch, a fourth hole. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got something. Something in my eyes kind of bother me here. Um, Okay. So some of the some of the space bars have offset offset switches. That's that's why I was wondering if the seven you happen to be in the center exactly, or if it was offset. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure which. I think it is centered exactly. So what we what we want to look for is some way for this to be the same spacing. So that's a 225, that would have to make that. We may, we may come back to this another time. Let's see. The 6 is way offset. Yeah, the 6 is offset because it, it uses the same amount as the 6 and a quarter, I think. Or the same amount as the 6 and a half. Okay, I tell you what, I will, I will come back to those another day and figure out exactly where those are supposed to be positioned. But for now, I'm just going to put them here, and we're, we're going to carry on with the rest of this. You'll see one thing we're missing here are uh, stabilizers. So I'm going to have to add those in because uh, those are not part of my switch footprint. If I would have left the original switch footprint that I was using, then the stabilizers would have been there. Um, so. I need to add those in here, so make sure we don't put components where the stabilizers are going to be and make sure the, hole, the PCB has holes for stabilizers. So stabilizers are going to be on uh, the two, um, the inner, the left shift, and the space bar. We'll ignore these other ones for right now. And then um, the optional 2U backspace um, will have a stabilizer as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a footprint. Um, make sure you're seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, you're seeing. Okay. Oh, I just put my computer seat. Oh, there we go. Okay. Did it again. It's putting my screen to sleep because I'm going in the top right corner. Now I've got notifications showing. It's because I have the monitor on the wrong side. Okay, so back to what we're doing here. Um, I want to make sure that I get the stabilizers put in. I can do place footprint and that will work, but 
Kitekat has this nice little, uh, we'll call it a feature, that it tries to load everything in one big dialog, all of the libraries, and that takes forever to do. So I found the little trick is, I just duplicate one of these footprints that I already have here. And then I'm going to edit that footprint and change its footprint. Uh -huh. Oh, little shit. But make sure that we switch this back to just this one in particular. Actually, I got to do something else. I need to change the reference first. Um, I'm going to call this ST for stabilizer for the key 59. And uh, it's not going to have a value. So I'm just going to delete that so it doesn't show up on the board. And then I'm going to change that footprint. Make sure it just has this one. You click the View Footprints button. That shows me only the ones that are in. And it shows me this dialog. If I show this footprints, that shows me the big dialog with all the stuff in there. Uh, I don't. I guess if you only had a few libraries loaded, that might make sense. But I don't. So I have the stabilizers in here that I need. I'm gonna have to get a footprint for a 7 view stabilizer here. Sure. So, actually, that's what I need right now. Uh, I believe I have them over here. No, no. I don't know where I get stabilizer from. Yeah, I don't have a seven U stabilizer. I'll have to find that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a six and a quarter in right now since uh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, change the footprint by that and then I'll move that back on top of it so that would give you the cutout for the six and a quarter U stabilizer uh, in the correct orientation over here now then, let's go back to the ones we know left shift is a 225 we're going to duplicate that Edit that. And you have to click OK out of this dialog. It's kind of one of the annoying things about it. You can't um, you can't go straight into the change footprints, or it won't have the new footprint reference. And then it won't work right. This is a two and a quarter. Which is actually identical to a 2U stabilizer. I'm not sure why there's a different footprint. Oh, the, the different footprint is because it actually shows the outline in this footprint of the of where the keycap is going to go. That's what that white box is showing. That white box won't be printed on the PCB. I'm uh, going to do this inner. Duplicate, go down, edit, change this. There's two twenty five also. Okay. Um, one more up here. Extra. And now when I cancel that dialog, it actually canceled the entire thing. This is really nice of it. So when you duplicate, why are you duplicating the footprint and changing the type? The state oh okay. The stabilizer has its own footprint. Right. I'm adding a new footprint for the stabilizer. And I'm just duplicating it because it's easier than adding one. Okay. So this footprint is not tied to anything in the schematic. It's just a it's just a 
footprint that only exists on the on the PCB. So now we got those on there. So now we want to figure out where are we going to put these components. So first of all, what all do we have up here? Um, this is our USB port. This is our speaker, switch, crystal. These are mounting holes. Uh, this is the connector for the ISP that I was talking about earlier. This is the actual uh, controller. Um, and then all the capacitors, and then up here we have all the diodes, and then we have the LEDs with their capacitors that go with them. So the older versions of KiCad would actually just stack all this stuff on top of each other when you brought it in, which was really, really obnoxious. This is really nice that it does it all um, laid out at least for you, kind of on this little grid. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select all these I don't really matter I don't really care exactly where they are so I'm going to flip them all at once because I need them all on the bottom and then move them down here where they're not so far underway um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think about where am I going to put mounting holes and I should probably put mounting holes for a traditional 60% case since this would would in theory fit in like a GH60 poker case so I will, I don't have those offhand right now. Um, I know that uh, user AI03 has a nice footprint, or maybe it's, I'm not sure. But one of them has a nice footprint that is a single footprint that has the entire, has all the mounting holes for a, for a standard 60%. So I don't have that downloaded, but I will go, I'll have to go grab that later. And drop it in here so that's that's one option or I can uh, kind of put these mounting holes wherever I want to since we're going to be building the case from scratch um, I'm just going to do that for now Oops. sometimes uh, if you just click in a random place it gets the drawing box so maybe it's often better to use the move command because you don't don't move stuff you're not intending to move um, so exactly where you lay out the mounting holes, if it's not for an existing case, is just really kind of up to how much support you think it will need. Um, these mounting holes that I have in here, this number, this quantity, is based on, uh, again, that larger layout. So I'm not sure that I'm going to need all these. I drew these particular holes with uh, this particular footprint with some extra circles around it that you see. And that kind of gives me an idea of this is where I don't want to have anything running through. So I, I don't I can't have any component in this this outer circle and I don't want to have any traces in that outer circle either, but I definitely don't want any traces in the inner circle. Um, and then this this smallest circle is the actual pad itself. So this is this is something I like to add in so that I don't end up with with stuff that gets shorted out bit by screws or uh, you know, interferes with with standoffs or anything like that. So I've kind of tweaked that, that footprint to my to my liking. Um, again, I don't know that we need all of these mount points for for this size. But see, that's probably not a good idea to put that there because that's going to conflict with the stabilizer. So if you had a standoff and you used a screw in stabilizer, yeah, there might be a problem. So you know, maybe over here is a better place to put it. Uh, this is probably where we're going to want to put the controller, though. So um, I'll find another place. Sixty percent left side. Mm 
And again, this, and this is something that might get moved as we go to start designing the case. We might decide, hey, you know, it'd be better if we had that in this other location. So, you know, this is not necessarily set in stone. You can always, you can always tweak that later. Just trying to just trying to balance out, you know, where you're going to have some mounting holes, so that you get nice support for the PCB. Space might even as possible. This is the nice thing. Nice thing about ortho is you just put them in. You put them in between two mm -hmm. rows and two columns, and you don't have to worry about yep. where exactly you can put it. I, if this was an ortho build, I'd probably be done by now. <laughs> it's a it's a whole lot easier to design an ortho. You don't you don't sound like an ortho at all. I'm just saying that it would be a, easier to design a PCB. Do you like it? Okay, right. that looks like a lot of screw holes to me. So I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and delete this last one. Because, uh, that's weird. Yeah, as a time check, I'm 12 minutes over my two hour period. So. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Mike suggested I kind of go ahead and do just a little bit of uh, stuff that to to show it, and then we'll, we'll come back and do uh, come back to the rest of it. Uh, probably off stream. So first thing you want to place is the controller. So I'm looking for a relatively empty space, um, ideally not too far from the USB. Um, I've used a smaller package here. This is a QFN package. It's pretty small. It'll fit in a lot of tight places. I'm kind of eyeing this spot here uh, by the control. A lot of times on a 60%, on a they'll go down here by the space bar. Then that's a lot of really long traces. So I'm going to see if I can fit it in here in this space by the tab and the, what would be the caps lock on a normal 60%. So I'm going to come in here. And a lot of times if you'll rotate this at... Oops, 45 degrees, then it will be easier to, to wrap the traces out of and to fit in these tight spaces. So um, I'm gonna have to turn my grid back to something small so I can position this exactly where I want it. So I'm gonna get my uh, 10 millimeter grid. Put that in there. I, I don't wanna put it too close to this pad over here or I'm gonna have a hard time getting those traces out. I'm trying to give it the most space possible to get stuff out of here. It's probably. Let's see. I'm not going to have as much stuff going to the left, so maybe, maybe I could put it further up like that. This is all on the same side of the board right now, right? Yeah. So everything that's green is on one side of the board. Everything that's red, which you can't see, is which you don't see any of, is on the other side of the board. And everything that's yellow is on both sides of the board. So, yeah, so there's holes and then uh, you know, pads around the through holes. That one's that, that ground pad is on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, so given that I've, I want to put the controller here, I probably don't want to put that ground, I mean that uh, mm -hmm. mounting hole right there because it's going to make it really hard to <clears throat> To wrap things, so I'm going to go ahead and move that over here. Right now. Again, I, I may come back and, and just replace this with a standard layout, um, a standard uh, positioning of the holes, but we'll see. Okay, so then uh, we're going to have to have a USB port, and it's going to need to be uh, traditionally between columns two and three. Uh, it's going to have to stick out fairly far to fit with these sockets. So somewhere right in there looks like about as close in as we can get it. Let's 
to get there. And what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll we'll move this um, edge of the board out, and then we'll add a little stick out for the for the USB port. Um, yeah, what I'll probably end up having to do on these also is uh, rotate these two switches at least um, so that this can sit back down in here a little bit so it's not sticking quite so far off the board. Does that going to affect um, LEDs? Well, there's no LEDs, so it doesn't affect LEDs. There's no holes for LEDs. Oh, that's right. I'm gonna have LEDs on this board. That's it would affect LEDs. That's but the, that's convenient if you do choose to build to build a board without LEDs. Yeah, it is convenient. Um, <laughs> don't, rotate. don't rotate. Yeah, I I need to go back and see how far that should stick out. Um, on the other board I did, I didn't have that. Those switches rotated in a bit, so I'm not sure. That is a, a mini USB, not a Type C. Uh, I, I went over that earlier. Um, why I chose that over the other one? Why did you choose that? Uh, yeah. So I chose that because it's easier to solder. That's the main <laughs> reason. <laughs> That's the main reason. I'm trying to put this reset switch in a place that it's not going to interfere with uh, routing traces. So I'm going to stick it over here, kind of out of the way. Um, and then the speaker is going to have to go somewhere where I'm actually going to have room for it. Um, I'm going to stick it down here for right now. Um, probably I'm going to have to move that because there's probably going to be a stabilizer. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it over here where there's going to be a blocker. We'll put the speaker behind the blocker. Does that sound like a good idea? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll pop a few of these diodes in here so you can see um, exactly where they're supposed to go Just and how this, is, how this is going to work. But what's that? Does the Scarlet Bandana have USB C? Uh, it does not currently. Okay. No. Many USB. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for diode 1. I can use this search feature and find D1. There it is. Oops. D1. They're, they don't come in in really any kind of rhyme or reason um, in terms of where they are. The reason I want, uh, I want diode 1 is because it belongs to switch 1. And if I don't put it with switch 1, then that really makes things difficult. Um, I'm going to put this... I like to stick them kind of in the footprint of the um, switch. And they're going to be on the bottom, so they're not interfering it. We don't have to worry about people soldering, so I can kind of pack these in here as close as I feel comfortable with. So I'm not worried about. Normally, that's something you, you do want to worry about, is um, if you're going to have end users soldering the board, you want to make sure that you know, your diodes are not particularly close to the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bump this out and I'm gonna rotate these back because I don't like the fact that they rotate. I'm either gonna rotate them all or I'm gonna rotate none of them, okay? So, well, except for that backspace, I had to rotate it. Um, Okay, so I won't I won't go through all this right now, but so laying out these diodes is something that I want to add to the script because it's pretty easy to say I want the diode to be a, you know X Y offset from the from the center of each switch, so then each diode would be here by default next to its switch, and then. You know, you're gonna have to make some adjustments as you as you place other stuff, but that's gonna you know get 90, 90 to ninety five percent of them without you having to go and do a bunch of extra work. Um, 
Yeah, Megaforce. If you if you didn't catch all that, we I went through and defined all that stuff uh, earlier, so you'll have to uh, go back and watch that after after the stream. It'll be available. Um, okay, so we're we're gonna go ahead and wire some stuff up. Uh, X goes into wiring uh, mode, laying out traces. Um, I'm using the, the OpenGL, which in the newer version of the KiCad is called Modern Accelerated Graphics, um, instead of Legacy Graphics. So it, it has some fancy features that you'll see in a minute when it comes to routing traces. So that's, you can see when I click on one of these, it tells me where it needs to be connected to. Um, so when I click on one of these, the bottom of this, now it's gonna say, okay, it needs to be connected to that next pad over there, and then I click on this and it's going to show me it needs to be connected to all those diodes up there and it needs to be connected somewhere to this pad right here on the um, on the microcontroller. So that's going to connect in there and then again so this is the rest of the rows so well see I don't have the diodes all laid out so laying out the rows is going to be a little awkward but um, the columns will be pretty straightforward so the columns so this is this is one of those cases where um, normally when you're laying out a PCB, you lay out all of the the vertical traces on the back or the you know on one side and all the horizontal traces on the other side. Um, but when you're laying out one with sockets, all of the traces, I mean all of the sockets, are on the same side. So normally you have a through hole switch you can just connect to either side of it but in this case I don't I have a pad a surface mount pad so I need to make sure that I connect this um, if I want to run these traces on the vertical then I need to I need to actually put a via in so I'm going to hit V for via and now it's going to flip me to the back side of the board and then I'm going to have to hit another via to pick up this pad I'm going to put another one right there, and then, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. See, I'm thinking ortho, and it's just supposed to be straight down, and it's not just straight down. Okay, so I'm going to be on the back of the board. I'm going to come over here, put another via in, and drop it down right there. Now what I like to do is go back to the back, back or sorry, the front side of the board, and um, connect back to that same via instead of making a new one. And then... It come down here. Okay, yeah, so this is sort of most funny. Depending on exactly how you got there, it has different opinion about which way your traces should go. The spacing was done by a script that reads in the KLE file. The spacing was done with a script that reads in the KLE file. That is correct. And it is a really handy feature to have. I'm just trying to route these kind of away from the controller so that uh, I, don't, I have more space here to route other stuff later because that's going to be a problem. Um, so this is kind of how I like to do these uh, for these ones with the sockets uh, is lay out a via right at the top of the one column, connect it, one pad connected to the one right above it, and then this is going to have a you know just a so top mount uh, thing right there. So this is this is kind of interesting. Um, this might be a case where we want to go back and shift where these are defined in the matrix because this is column two and that's column three. So now I've either got to have this real funny trace running across over here or because there's a, a, a jump right here, this is column four and that's, that's column five and there is no column five defined down here in the bottom row. I could move all these over one and then it wouldn't have to make these these jagged jumps like that. But for now, you know, we're just gonna wire that up. So some, sometimes how your PCB laid out is gonna influence how your schematic is laid out. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. And, Sometimes KiCad will do funny things like that with your with your trace, and I don't I don't want that trace to run all all jagged through there. So I'm just going to come back and pick it up right there. 
So that's kind of that's kind of how how we're gonna do that. And then and then as we fan out from the controller to get to these various things, we wanna we wanna keep the traces as neat as possible. And so that it's easier to, to it's easier to see where things are going and it's easier to make changes and, and various things like that. So uh, for instance we've got and this is where this is where you may want to come in later and figure out and, and change the pin mappings set to something that makes sense for for the particular layout you have. Um, or or even rotate this this chip which I didn't uh, didn't check the orientation of when I set it. Um, I'm looking right now to see which orientation it's in because I might want to. I think I want to change it. So this is the. Let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and place these USB resistors. Should have, I guess it, I guess I didn't name that. Name that. So it's, it's these two right here. So that's the other thing is I gotta have room for some USB resistors right here. They're ideally supposed to be as close to this this USB port as possible, and we're supposed to keep the traces uh, aligned in kind of a certain particular orientation, um, evenly spaced and and without different uh, bends and such. So. Having these two pads here sticking out is really difficult to work with. So I probably am going to have to end up rotating these two. Uh, but for now, we'll just roll with it. Of course, I got them on the wrong side, so I'm going to switch them. I'll have to check later exactly how close those are. Uh, they may be maybe too close. Um, I don't want to run my traces like that. I want these two traces to look the same. Um, so ideally, they're shaped exactly the same. Because because they're, they're it's a differential signal, and so you want them to be to have the same trace length. Um, there is a differential pair routing mode in KiCad. I, I haven't had a whole lot of, I haven't liked it a whole lot, um, but it is there. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. These are on the opposite side of the chip, and that's not what I want. I want to put them on the same side, so I want to rotate this. Um, one more time. So I'm going to... Okay. So this is this is one of the features of this OpenGL routing mode is it'll shove this other trace out of the way. You can see what it's doing. It'll shove this other trace out of the way to make room for this one. Um, in this case, that's not what I want to do because I can't get through that gap. But I'll show you in a minute how that can be can work to our advantage. So I'm going to bring these down around like that. I probably want to move that diode. Um, so that I'm not having to run the USB lines right next to it because the diodes are going to be the the column scanning on the matrix is going to be flipping those and basically driving a high frequency uh, signal along those and I don't want that to be near the USB lines because it can cause interference um, so you see here that it's I can shove this out of the way and it'll run it right along with it, and that that's that's weird. <laughs> Sometimes it has a mind of its own. Um, but most of the time it works pretty well. So I can I can get these where it kind of cleaned up where they're looking kind of nice there. Again, I I'll probably I need to shift some stuff around so that these are these are more even this is not a nice a nice angle for these you just want to have the same tracing but, uh, 
for for now. I'll just leave it. Um, and uh, again, like I was talking about earlier, all these uh, all these capacitors go near the the uh, controller. So I'm gonna move these all down here by the controller. And if I click on one of these, this is let's see which one is this. oh this is the this is the UCAP capacitor that I was talking about earlier. So this this needs to be near the pin that it connects to, which is right there, and then ground will connect uh, to the ground pair on that side. So we ask if I rotated this. So this is this is the kind of stuff that um, is going to take take some time to lay all this out. Um, I was going to do kind of the cooking show thing and have some of this stuff pre pre done. Um, and I probably should have, but you know how that goes. I know how that goes. <laughs> uh, and I could rotate that at a forty-five if I wanted to. But. Um, I don't know, I'd feel odd if I was retiring the whole time. Yeah, it, it really is better to have, so all the rest of these are all VCC and ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put essentially one next to each corner of the, uh, microcontroller, that's the word I'm looking for. And because I know that there's a voltage Pair near each corner of this, and I think it's pretty useful. So I, I kind of like this layout. It's rotating 45 degrees. Um, so if I click that there, let's see. Yeah. So you see, when you when you go to route in KiCad, it shows you, you know, what else is this supposed to connect to? So it's supposed to connect to all of these different USB. I mean, all these different VCC lines. So we'll connect that up. And then we'll connect this up to here. And see that one should be rotated around because so those are you think of electricity kind of like water, which is a really good analogy most of the time. Yeah. Um think of it kind of like a water storage tank, right? So it's yeah. like a storage tank for electricity near the near the controller. Mm -hmm. So when it needs an inrush of current, it it has it available right nearby. So it doesn't have to pull it through the traces over a long distance, which uh -huh. would cause the voltage to dip. Yeah. So there it's it's readily available. Right, so it's a little reservoir. It's a little reservoir. Yeah, yeah it's very cool. I'm I'm learning. And you see there are a few other VCCs that I don't have anything tied to. Just around. You may expect that there's one per VCC. That is the spec, is that there's one per line. One of these is UVCC, and, and one of the capacitors is a 1U instead of a 10th U, which is capacitor 1. And so I'm going to put it in here. Maybe. Let's see. Yeah, there's some guys on the stream that know more about PCBs than I do, so they can correct me if I'm wrong. So, so now they're they're all independently tied to. Let's see, I missed one over here. One of those is the analog VCC, and I don't care as much about it um, because I'm not doing any analog. So I'm just going to tie it to the same capacitor as the other one that's close to it, and that is 
1044. That's the one I just did. So this is actually analog VCC. So what I wanted to do was sorry. So UVCC is pin two. That's the one that I did just tie over here to that one. So pin 44 is analog. And there's one more over here, which is on pin seven. Sorry, I'm putting the wrong key. Um, pin seven is is V bus. So, yeah, that's the. So that's where the that's where the the voltage comes in from the controller. Moves. Yeah, that that's what I was that's what I was looking at, like. Oh, C C six is U cap. I think you're talking about C five. Yes. Oh, I thought he said C six. You missed one. Yeah, my eyes are not working very well right now. So, you can make A B C C to B C C. Yeah, that's. I was just trying to find the pin pin mapping. That's what I was planning on doing. Was putting uh, putting this one kind of over here on this side, and then I'm just going to that one. So the other thing I got to think about is that I need to be able to get this this pin out to wherever it's supposed to go. Actually, I don't know if it's supposed to go to anything. What's pin one connecting? I don't know each other. <laughs> yeah, it's not connected. So I probably did that on purpose um, because it's got a VCC line on either side of it. I've either got to I'd either have to run it out and put a VIA right there, which I could do if I needed to get it out. Uh, but I don't need to connect it to anything, so it's really convenient that I just throw that in there. And then, uh, yeah, we'll just connect this one up right there. That one, uh, yeah, so that's actually the ground pair that that's supposed to connect to. So if I I'm gonna take this around, connect these grounds together. So what do you so you've got diodes, you've got capacitors in, and there you go, you want to help Yeah, it is. So um so the the rest of it is is making getting all this stuff out to where it needs to go. Um what I'm what I'm kind of seeing right now is that I'm probably gonna want to take some of these pins that have uh for instance column 10, it needs to go all the way over to there. Um which means it's going to have to go across a bunch of other stuff. So I might want to, I might want to take that. Well, I don't know. Let's just try to route it and see what happens. Um, you see here that I, I have these kind of out of order. Um, that that's that's what I was trying to. What I was thinking is that because column one and two are right here, it would probably make sense to have this be column two because then it can just go straight out to there I mean sorry column one and then make you know the next one be called well the next one might yeah either way um, there's there's kind of an art to it and and you just kind of the, the reason these are all kind of in weird places like this is because the last board I had them on that's where it made sense to route them to but um, let's let's just go through kind of this exercise of, of how to um, how to route these. So these are going to go these are going to go over this direction, and then tie them in, um, and then you're going to pull the next one, and it's going to be column in this case column 14, and and I, I'm going to have to move that capacitor because I don't have enough space to get these out of here. Um, so that's probably the first thing is is to get these out. And this this is really tight spacing. And this is some I'm gonna I may have to make some adjustments to the to the positioning of this uh, footprint to actually be able to get all this stuff mapped correctly. Now that you've drawn the traces, I'm seeing that they don't move with the components that you 
choices don't move with the components, and that's kind of unfortunate. I'm hitting U here, um, and that selects everything that's un that's connected in that segment until it hits another branch. Um, so that lets me kind of clean this stuff up easily. But yeah, when you rotate a component, the traces don't move with it, which is rather unfortunate because that would make it easier to you know, do, to make adjustments, but yeah. that's kind of not what it's designed to do. Okay, so now I've got room to get these out. Uh, except this is column one and column two. Like I said, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I need this to run off to the right and column one and column two are to the left. Um, so what I'd rather see is this be uh, column like 9, 10, 9, 10, 11, and 12 instead of 9, 4, 1, and 2. And then, and then when I run those off to the right, they'll all be um, the same and they'll just branch off and it'll... It'll look nice. You do it on the QK, right? What's that? You're not the pins and everything. Yeah. So, but I, I need to go back to the schematic, see, right. and right. and adjust uh, what's mapped where. So, this is this is kind of a, a back and forth thing that. Um, you just have to you have to learn. I mean, you have to kind of iterate. Some people will will run them kind of the opposite way. So you start at the columns and run them back toward the controller and then you'll be able to see everything uh, kind of as it as it should be. And I know exactly why I have these column one and two where I have them because they also need to go to that header for the... Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, sorry, not header, but that uh, connector. So this this connector here, which is which is for the in system programming, I need to place that somewhere um, where there's room for it again. And honestly, this is a rather large <laughs> footprint for those surface mount pads. The through hole one might actually be a smaller footprint. I'm not sure, um, but. On the previous board I had, I had that place somewhere in it, and wherever those pads were was close to columns one and two. So, um, okay. So, there's a couple ways you can do this. the The simplest way is to make those changes on the schematic, and then and then bring them back over um, by re-importing the netlist. I will have to get a tag connect footprint. Yeah, I, I have seen that. I, I just didn't look real hard to find a better footprint. Um, so you can actually change the net name right here. So if I want to change this to column 10, and this one to column 11, and this one to column 12. And that propagates to the... That does not propagate to the... What did I just hit? I think I flipped that. That does not propagate to the schematic. Um, and that's kind of yeah. one of the unfortunate things that, about... That doesn't propagate to the schematic, but you're changing the net. That I'm changing the net. So oh, that's still pretty cool. If I change it here um, in the schematic, then next time I import the, the net list, if I need to do it again, mm -hmm. I won't lose this change. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to need to... Now it thinks I should connect that to that. So I'm going to have to remap column 10, of course, to somewhere else. But, uh, so now I'm going to run this column 10 over to there, connect it up. Column 11. I'll zoom in and out. Column 11 over there. And you see what, what this uh, this routing mode is doing. It's just pushing, pushing those traces, traces against each other kind of into a... I can I can push them up as far as they'll go, and it makes a nice, neat little uh, little bus. Little uh, you gotta be sure you don't do stuff like that. So now now you get this nice little branching pattern with all the traces neatly lined up next to each other and branching out. And then thirteen. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. This is gonna be thirteen.
forgot for a second you were doing columns. Maybe you're connecting them all to the same pad, man. Yeah. And then ideally, if I had something close by here, I could run to column 14. So let's take, let's see, for 16 and 17 with no connects. No, that's the crystal. Okay. So that that's the other important thing that I kind of I kind of left out uh, is your crystal. The crystal is is one of the most critical components, and it is going to go right here. So I'm going to have to be careful about what I write around it. But I'll have to read out some stuff later. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and make this one column 14 since I already have a column 12, and. What I'm going to do is wrap that up next to those other ones and then run them all kind of together. Make sure that like that. So now I have that nice, uh, nice branching, nice tight traces across there. But like I said, I need to now come in and, and drop the, the crystal right here. And it, it is one of the more sensitive components on the board, and so I have to be careful about how I how I place it. So I need to make some room for it. So I'm going to put this uh, capacitor. Let's see. So probably after I wrap this crystal, I'm going to go ahead and um, and drop off the, the stream for now. Um, so let's do this so that you get an idea of what's involved, where is that thing that is. Okay. So again, um, the crystal is kind of like the USB in that we want to have the, the traces be as similar as possible. So I'm gonna I'm gonna route it. I'm gonna rotate it at 45 degrees as well. So that it sits parallel to the uh, board. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna line up let me get rid of this giant it says 16 megahertz to this one. You're just turning invisible. Um, So line up these these kind of with these two pads and get this kind of as close as possible. Yeah, see I'm not quite lined up. I'll probably did you find that? Did you do that there? Yeah, what? Can I put can you can you push a trace? You there? can push the trace with another trace. Unfortunately you can't push it with something else, which would be nice. Yeah, I'm just like but, you know, push it with the that would be a cool move. Yeah, maybe you got another trace right there. You see that little bit of Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's the that's the other one. Uh, so now now it lines up better. Um, so now the other thing we want to do is we want to keep any interference out of this. So we do that by surrounding it with the uh, ground. Um, so I'll come in and I'll I'll connect this to ground, and then. Uh, I'm not going to tie it to that ground over there. I'm going to put a, uh, yeah, I'm going to put a via kind of on each corner of this. And then, let's see. It's really, uh, I don't know if I can reduce my footprint or if I really just don't have that much space here. Maybe. Maybe that I really just don't have that much space here. And then I'm going to run one more on the on the bottom side across there. And now I've got this thing kind of boxed in so that when I run the ground plane, there won't be any anything underneath it. Um, what's oh, that you? <laughs> And we'll, we'll, I'll do the fill in the ground plane later. And I, I, I'll i probably record some of this uh, some of this stuff so you can watch it at a later time. 
Uh, so now I've got to get this out of here without interfering with uh, the crystal stuff. I don't really want to go under these traces, so I kind of kind of stuck going around them. And unfortunately, I'm, oh, this is just sitting here. This is the unfortunate part of the shove mode. I could I could turn it off if I really wanted to. <laughs> I don't know what it did. It it does some funny stuff sometimes. It has mine of its own. Um, and then I've got a couple more traces I've got to get out of this corner, so I'm going to have to reorient some stuff with this capacitor. So pin 22 is a no connect. So if I, well, I'm just trying to figure out which, uh, so I gotta figure out what, what column to remap that one to now. So now if I, I've got 14, so if I go back down, this one is, ah, lost it. So 9 through 12, so then if I pull in column 8. I think I can actually fix those those tracks so they don't get shut that way. Um, so now I can have the bottom side peel off in the other direction. Or the other thing I could do is is uh, alternate. Look kind of cool actually. If I have one going up, one going down. Oh, no, sorry, I'm just talking to myself. But. Make this one column seven, and then this will come out here and shove these traces all the way next to those, and then run across. Like with the stream running and trying to do all this processing at the same time, it just doesn't like me. My computer doesn't like it. Um, yeah, so then I can come back and clean this up. Yeah, uh, that's the basic idea. And it's just a lot more of, of that repetition and, and trying to fit it all as best as best you can. Uh, th these are ugly. I'm gonna have to move those back back where they were. But um, I may end up switching some different different pins and, and whatever to get the best the best kind of layout with the least number of overlaps and vias and such. So yeah, just a bunch of just a bunch of trial and error. <laughs> a lot of a lot of it, <laughs> and just just manual, manual making it all making it all fit. So, 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and close out the stream. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to shoot me an email, uh, hop on the Discord. Um, if you go to my website, scroll down to the bottom, what do you that click? Scroll down to the bottom, there's a link to the Discord. Uh, I'm always in the Discord. Happy to answer your questions. Um, and yeah, tune in next week where I will have cleaned a bunch of this up. And I will. go on to the case design. So I'm going to I'm going to get this cleaned up. I'm going to send it off for production. Uh, typically from one of the Chinese fabs, I'll probably order from Easy EDA. That will take about a week to get to my door with DHL shipping. So almost almost a week to the day, sometimes less. I've had it as little as 5 days. Um, DHL shipping come to the door and then so in 2 weeks We'll do the PCB assembly, and then after that, um, do the case CNC, and then finally the last fifth week we'll do the uh, final assembly and testing of everything. So, tune in next time. Thanks.